So up until now, we've kind of talked about evolution and natural selection in um, general terms. For the next two chapters, we are going to talk about kind of a more um, complete or explicit model of the mechanisms of evolution. And we're going to do that with population genetics. And what population genetics does is it sort of integrates evolution by natural selection with Mendelian genetics. And so in doing that, we can develop this more sort of explicit treatment of natural selection. So to begin, we can, we'll just explicitly define population genetics, or we'll even loosely call it evolutionary genetics. Um, we'll define that as the process that causes allele frequencies or genotypic frequencies to change from one generation to the next in these populations. If you remember, that was also our sort of, our, our most basic definition of evolution. So the change of an allele frequency or a trait frequency for one generation to the next. And so you can kind of see here how evolution via natural selection and population genetics are connected. So let's just start by defining a few terms or reminding you the meaning of a few terms. Phenotype. Phenotype is just sort of the physical, morphological manifestation of the genetic component of an, of an organism or, in reality, the genetic component mixed with an environmental influence in, in the vast majority of cases. The genotype is just sort of the genetic composition of that organism. And then, sort of more abstractly, a model. We need to kind of Think about what the function of a model is. Um, when we have a model, or we can even call it a hypothesis, right? Well, what we're trying to do is we're trying to sort of tease out some of the more important parameters or aspects of something that will allow us to oftentimes predict what will happen, for instance, in this case, from one generation to the next. So the unit that we are concerned with, or our model unit in population genetics, is obviously the population. So let's define the population. A population is a group of interbreeding individuals um, and their offspring. That's generally, when we talk about uh, populations, we generally talk also about sort of geographical limitations, sort of physical geographical limitations. So here we have in the blue circle a population of individuals. Each of these individuals is represented by a genotype. That genotype is a, made up of um, two different alleles, big A and little a, and those allele combinations are what we call, again, like in the last slide, is what it is, is a genotype. So here we're just looking at one gene, the different versions of the genes that are found in the individual, and we find in diploid organisms, which for simplicity's sake, that's all we're going to talk about here. In diploid organisms, we have two different genes because we have two different chromosomes. We have two different number one chromosome, number two chromosome, number three chromosome, one of which was inherited from our father, one of which was inherited from our mother. Okay, so each individual here, we have one individual, uh, for instance, up there in the upper left hand corner, big A, big A. They have the same kind of um, gene or, or allele at that gene, right? We call that homozygous because they're the same. Big A, little a is a heterozygous individual because it has the two different versions of the gene. A big A version and a little a version. Okay, so now we have this population and we can describe this population in um, a number of different mathematical terms. Those mathematical terms generally involve different kinds of frequencies. In order to calculate frequencies, we have to first calculate a population size. So for this particular uh, population, and it's obviously a, a pretty simplified population, but we can calculate or we can count, really, just the number of individuals that make up that population. So in this particular case, we count up the individuals and we see that there are eight individuals in the population. In the population. We usually uh, identify that with a capital N. We say N equals 8 because there's 
and there are eight individuals in that population. We can also look at a population in terms of alleles. So because each individual has two alleles, we can also say that this N, and then we usually do a subscript A for the allele, the population of alleles, equals 16 because there's 16 different uh, versions of the genes within that whole entire population. Okay, so below that population size, we see uh, an F and then in brackets big A big A. That simply is, is saying uh, or asking what is the frequency of the big A big A genotype. Those top three are genotypic frequencies. The bottom two where you see the F and then in parentheses big A or F and in parentheses little a, those are allele frequencies. Okay, so first let's just calculate the genotypic frequencies. So to calculate the genotypic frequency of the big A, big A genotype, all we do is count the number of individuals that have, bi have a big A, big A. And so you can go through, uh, go through count, and we see that there are three individuals. There are eight total individuals. So the uh, genotypic frequency of the big A, big O genotype is 37.5%. Okay. 37.5% of the population are big A, big A genotypes. We can also see there uh, are, we can also do the same thing for the other genotypes. So the other genotype, the heterozygous individuals, uh, big A, little a, we also see there are three of those. Those also have a frequency of 30, same math, three over eight, divide three by eight, you get 37.5%. Uh, Lastly, the little a, little a, the homozygous, uh, that homozygous uh, genotype, we see that there are two individuals, so two divided by eight is 25%. If you add 37.5 plus 37.5 plus 25, you should get 100% or one. They should all eat, they should all sum to one. Same thing with the allele frequencies. So with the allele frequencies, we can do the same thing. We can just count all of the big A alleles. We see that there are nine. Nine divided by 16 is 56.25%. That's the allele frequency of the big A. Um, we count up the little a's, seven, we can count seven, seven divided by 16 is 43.75%. That is the allele frequency of the little a. Add those two together and you get 100% or one. So let's say I described a population to you. I said the n, n equals 100, so the population size, there's 100 individuals in the population, and these are the following genotypic frequencies. 25% for big A, big A, 50% for big A, little a, and 25% for little a, little a. Given the genotypic frequencies and the population size, could you calculate the allele frequency? And the answer is yes. All you need to do is times the, the genotypic frequency by the total number of individuals in the population, and you can get the number of big A, big A individuals, which equals 25, the number or N value of big A, little a, which equals 50 individuals, times in, um, the, the genotypic frequency by the number, uh, the population number, 50% um, times 100, and then also the number of little a, little a individuals, uh, which equals 25. When you look at each of those individuals, so let's look first at the big A, big A individuals. Each big A, big A individual has two big A alleles. So you times the number of big A, big A individuals by two, and you get the total number of alleles that is sort of housed in those big A, big A individuals, and that's 50 big A alleles. If you look at the heterozygous individuals, the big A, little a individuals, you see that there are 50 of them, each of those individuals has one big A allele and one little a allele, right? And so the total number of alleles in that population that are contributed by the heterozygous, individu heterozygous individuals are 50 big A alleles and 50 little a alleles. Also for the little a, little a, homozygous individuals, there's 25 of them, but there's two little a alleles in each, for each of them. So you have 50 little a alleles. So the total population size uh, from a perspective of alleles is 200 total alleles. And so now to calculate the frequency, you just go the total number of big A alleles, 50 plus 50 equals 100. 100 divided by 200, that equals 50%. So you get the allele frequency of big A at 50%, the allele frequency of little a 
can't you can count those up 50 little alleles being contributed by the heterozygous individuals 50 little alleles being contributed by the 25 homozygous little little a individuals or the little a little a individuals again 100 alleles divided by 200 that equals 50 percent 50 percent plus 50 percent again equals 100 percent so given the genotypic frequencies and the population size you can calculate the allele frequencies So now the question becomes, if you're given allele frequencies, can you automatically know the genotypic, genotypic frequencies? Just like before, or similar to when you were given genotypic frequencies, can you calculate, you can't, we saw that you can calculate allele frequencies from those. So just as an example, let's say we have two alleles, we'll call one allele P, the other allele Q, and we'll put them both at 50%. Given these allele frequencies, it, this is this is akin to big A and little a, but we're just calling them P and Q. Given these allele frequencies, can you tell me what the genotypic frequencies would be? So try to do that. And the answer to that is no. So here we have three different populations. That middle population, you have 100% of the individuals as heterozygous. Right, so that's obviously a very different um, genotypic frequency uh, than you would have uh, on the one on the right, where 50% are big A, big A, these are the P's, and 50% are little a, little a. And then there on the uh, right, we have um, a mix of them. And so we have three different populations, all with very distinct genotypic frequencies. Okay, so given the Genotypic frequencies, we can calculate the allele frequencies, but the reverse does not happen, necessarily. So in order to study evolution from a reductionist sort of mathematical perspective, we have to have models that tell us something about what is happening with the allele frequencies. Because if you remember, again, evolution, the, most simplest, the simplest definition of evolution, is a change in allele frequency from one generation to the next. When natural selection acts on a population, and um, if a population is to evolve, you have to have a change of that. To evolve is to change that allele frequency from one generation to the next. And so we have to have a way of quantifying that. And the way that we quantify that is through this um, thing that we call the Hardy-Weinberg model. So the Hardy-Weinberg model is sort of an idealized population where no evolution is occurring. So in this case, whereas before we could take a genotypic frequency, we could calculate or, est or, or basically score a, an allele frequency from that genotypic frequency, but we saw the reverse wasn't true in a Hardy-Weinberg model or when a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the reverse is true. We can be given allele frequencies, and from those allele frequencies we can generate genotypic frequencies, and these genotypic frequencies are, are the frequencies that are in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so here this, this figure just kind of shows you, let's say we take an adult population of, my, of mice, right, and those, that adult population of mice, let's go back to big A, little a, let's say 60% of the, the allele frequency of the big A is 60% in that adult population. The allele frequency of the little A is 40%. When those mice go to make gametes, let's say they're, and, and we'll talk about the assumptions, but let's, they're going to basically make those gametes in those same proportions. If those gametes are sort of randomly getting together, they produce zygotes, those zygotes grow to be juveniles, those juveniles grow to be adults. If those allele frequencies are to in that first turn of this life cycle to be maintained at uh, 60 and 40 percent respectively, then no evolution can occur, right? And so in order for those things to happen, that population has to, um, has to uh, fulfill certain assumptions. And that's what we're going to talk about. So we're talking about a reverse. What are the assumptions we're talking about sort of the overall what the Hardy-Weinberg model is, and now let's talk about the assumptions that make up the Hardy-Weinberg model, rather than talking about the assumptions and then come up with the model. We're just sort of doing it slightly in reverse.
So these are the assumptions that basically ensure that a population is not going to evolve, uh, evolve right? There's no evolution is going to be happening. And so first we have to assume that no new mutations are occurring, right? So you're not generating new alleles because that obviously would change the original allele frequencies. Natural, selecting, natural selection cannot add or cannot uh, contribute in any way. So all organisms need to survive um, at the same, you know, at the same, have the same ability to survive, have the same ability to leave offspring, have the same ability to leave the same number of offspring. The, the population has to be large, infinitely large, in, in essence, meaning that there cannot be any random sampling error because what, we, what we'll see later is random sampling error can also change the little frequencies. Um, all of the members of the population need to breed and the breeding has to be done in a random fashion. You can't have like organisms or like individuals mating with like individuals. Um, that also will, will affect the evolution. Um, the, everybody has to produce the same number of offspring and there cannot be any new individuals coming into the populations because they would be bringing in new alleles and that would also be affecting the allele frequency. So in order for the allele frequency to stay the same from one generation to the next, in order for this Hardy-Weinberg model to be to be valid, you, you, you have to follow this, these set of assumptions. And what these assumptions do is make it that the uh, formation of the genotypic frequencies from one generation to the next is basically a random process. You're just randomizing everything. And it's only dependent on that original allele frequency. So at first glance, you may think, oh, wow, all those assumptions are pretty ridiculous. There's, you know, it's hard to imagine that any population could actually be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or follow that Hardy-Weinberg model. But in fact, what we see is some of those assumptions can be slightly robust. So say, for instance, you don't have to have an infinite population size, but maybe you can just have a very large population size. Um, or maybe you can mate close to randomly. And so uh, let's just take one natural population sea urchins and let's just go through um, and see what would happen if this, if this population was in fact um, in Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium. So you have sea urchins, sea urchins reproduce by basically broadcasting their gametes into the ocean water column and then the male gametes and the female gametes just sort of randomly uh, connect with each other, right, and that's where fertilization happens. And so sea urchins have to produce lots and lots and lots of gametes because it's sort of this random just sort of pairing with other gametes. And so if we were to look at a particular gene, and let's just say this gene doesn't necessarily have to code for something like color or anything like that, but maybe it's, you know, a, a gene that maybe is even, doesn't even get coded for, right? Um, or maybe it's coded for something, but it's something fairly neutral. And let's say we'll just start. We'll just start with the same allele frequency that we have been looking at, and that's an allele frequency of 50% big A, 50% little a. Right? It doesn't matter what it, what what the character is. Um, and let's say we have a sea urchin population with that allele frequency there on your right. Those are all of the gametes. It's, we, we call this a gene pool, right? And so all of their gametes get placed into this big gene pool. You can kind of think of it as a big kind of gross bucket full of gametes, right? And if they are randomly um, uh, colliding with each other, that's, what, that's what's causing fertilization, we can basically uh, estimate the allele frequencies for the next generation by kind of reaching our hand into that gene pool, into that gamete bucket, and pulling one out, and then pulling another one out. And we're just going to ignore the male gamete versus the female gamete. So if we were to do this, um, what would result? So let's say we pull in, I reach my hand in the bucket, pull out a big A, then I pull out a little A, and I take this, so that's a big A, little A, then the next time I pull out a little A, and then, a, then another little a, um, and there's so many gametes that we don't necessarily have to sample with replacement, but I continue to do that and I create a population in the next generation. What we see, just basically through statistics, 
is that in fact we can estimate those genotypic frequencies of the next generation. So let's think about this. An allele frequency of 50-50 is the same thing as flipping a coin. You have a 50% chance of reaching your hand in and grabbing a big A allele. You have a 50% chance of grabbing a little A allele, just like you have a 50% chance of flipping a heads versus flipping a tails. And so here, this coin example, these are big P, little P, rather than big A, little A, but same thing, right? Let's just say big A was heads, little A was tails. What is the probability of flipping two heads in a row, a big P, big P. And it's not probably too much of a surprise that the probability, if you, if you divide those into two separate events, right, the probability of event one, which is flipping a heads, is 50%, or one half. The probability of event two, which is flipping a heads again, is also 50%, or one half. And so the total probability is one half times one half, or one fourth, or 25%. So flipping two heads in a row, the probability is 25%. Just like that, flipping two uh, tails in a row or coming up with a genotype that's little a, little a in that next generation is also 25%. And flipping a head, then a tail is 25%, but you have to add that to flipping a tail first and then a head. Whenever you hear or in statistics for, two, for you know, any two any two, any two events, you add them, and so there's 50% probability of getting a big A, little a. So 25% big A, big A, 50% big A, little a, 25% little a, little a, and those in fact become your genotypic frequencies of the next generation when a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. But rather than, we'll make it more universal, rather than calling it big A, big A, and little a, little a, or frequency of big A, a frequency of little a, we're just going to call it P and Q. P is the frequency of one allele, Q the frequency of the other allele, and when we do that, we generate what's known as the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And this is what it looks like. P squared, which is the frequency of big A, big A in our previous model, or previous example, plus 2PQ, which is the frequency of big A little a, because there's two ways of getting it, right? Plus Q squared, which is the frequency of little a little a, and all of your frequencies have to equal 1, so P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared is equal to 1, where P is the frequency of one of the alleles, Q is the frequency of the other alleles. Now we can see that if a population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, meaning no evolution is occurring, right? you can generate the genotypic frequencies in that next generation, right? And then, in, let's say that's generation one, then if the population continues in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, the next generation after that, since the allele frequencies haven't changed, none of the assumptions have changed, is going, are, is going to be those same genotypic frequencies. So this introduces an interesting caveat. Um, regardless of the initial genotypic frequencies, once a population, you know, enters that Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, then in, within one generation, those Hardy-Weinberg frequencies are going to be met. So here you have two different populations, very different genotypic frequencies. You could go through and calculate either the, each of the allele frequencies, the allele frequency of the big A and the little a in the first population and the allele frequencies of the big A and the little a in the second population. You randomly sample those, you force those assumptions onto that population, and sure enough, what are you going to have in the next generation? Why don't we, just for exercise, try it, calculate the allele frequencies of each population on the left, population on the right, and generate the genotypic frequencies in the next generation under that assumption or that randomization assumptions, the assumptions that give the give it the, the going from one generation to the next, uh, that randomize that process and see and see what you get. So hopefully you should have seen those previous populations with those two previous populations that we had seen before where they have the same allele frequencies but very different genotypic frequencies, both of them within one generation under the Hardy-Weinberg assumptions, they, you generate uh, exactly the same genotypic frequencies. And those genotypic frequencies should have been 25% big A, big A, 50% big A, 
heterozygous individuals, big A, little a, and 25% little a, little a. All right, so now we have our model. What do we do with it? So a lot of times, in especially uh, sophomore or freshman level classes, we generate the model, we take a whole bunch of time generating the model, then we kind of stop there. But really, for our purposes, the model isn't the thing that is, you know, the end point or the thing that's important, but rather the starting point. Because if we're going to go and measure um, natural selection happening in, or evolution just in general happening, happening in a population, what we're going to want to do is be able to quantify it. So now our first step is to, uh, is to generating this model where no evolution occurs. And then we're going to go through and say, okay, what happens if something happens that affects the evolution? So what happens if, for instance, let's say that mating is not random? What sort of pattern or signature should we see in our population? And we can do that by getting theoretical predictions from our, from our model um, in sort of a mathematic way. So probably the best way to illustrate how we do this is to, you know, uh, work through a real life fake model, right? And so we're just going to pretend that a bunch of Weber State students, you know, volunteering uh, on sort of a medical thing down, and let's say they go to some sort of mountain village in Peru, and they are measuring blood types. So they're going to go and they're going to measure MN blood types, and so they go down there and they measure it. Uh, they measure the blood types of uh, this certain village and they come up with these results. 29 of the individuals in the village are MM, 42 are MN, and 29 are NN. Okay, so now maybe we had some notion that certain blood types were advantageous at high elevation, or we had some other sort of hypothesis where, it's, or maybe this is a is this is a population that has recently, maybe a couple generations, moved up to the high elevations from the lowlands, from the Amazonian lowlands or somewhere, and, they, and then we were trying to say, okay, is evolution happening in these blood types? Are we getting in a change in the allele frequency from one generation to the next? Because certain blood types are advantageous or not advantageous. Um, first thing that we'd have to do is have to say, okay, what's our basic model? If evolution wasn't occurring, here we have these, these genotypic frequencies. We would first want to say, ask the question, is this population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? So to do that, this is what we do. We take our population, 29 individuals that are MM, 42 individuals that are MN, and 26 individuals that are NN. We get a total population size for that. That's, a, that's the first thing that we, we need to do because we have to calculate the allele frequency of the M allele and the allele frequency of the N allele in the population. So in this case, the total population size is, size is 97. Since each individual has two alleles, the total allele population size is 194. We then look at the 29 individuals that are MM since each of those individuals has two M alleles. We write down 58 alleles plus the 42 alleles, the 42 M alleles that are part of the heterozygous individuals, those 42 MN individuals, and we divide it by 194, the total number of alleles, and that gives us 51.5%. So our M allele frequency is 51.5. Um, we then can go and calculate the N allele frequency. Since there's two alleles, then we should we have a good idea of what the N allele frequency should be. You should have 100% minus 51.5%, and that should give you your N allele frequency. But just to double check it, let's go through and, and, and do the, the, the same thing that we just did. So we would first look at those N, N individuals. There's 26 of them, times them by two, that equals 52 alleles for those individuals plus 42 alleles in the heterozygous individuals, divide that by 194, and uh, lo and behold, we get 48.5%. Now we have our allele frequencies. We then have to, we, once we have our allele frequencies, and then based on 
the Hardy-Weinberg equilibriums or the Hardy-Weinberg equation, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared, um, we can calculate the um, uh, Hardy-Weinberg equilibriums, what we would expect, how many individuals we would expect to be mm or mn or nn, given these allele frequencies, if the population was in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so for the first one, we, we calculate the frequency of uh, the mm denotype, that's the same thing as p squared. So we uh, just square 0 0.515, that equals 0 0.65. We then times it by the total population size, and what we see is we expect, and in this case, in the expected numbers, we're going to probably get decimal places, right? We expect 25.7 individuals in a population of 97 to be to have an mm genotype we now can compare that with our observed number our, our observed number was 29 our expected number is a little bit uh, below that next we go and we calculate the 2p squared so that's the frequency of the mn allele or the mn it's not allele sorry the mn genotype we go 2 times 0 0.51 which is the frequency of M times 0 0.485, which is the allele frequency of N. That gives us um, 0 0.500, 50 percent, 50 percent, times that by 97, that gives us a total of 48.5 individuals we would expect to be, um, to be a heterozygous we see that we observed 42, so slightly fewer than we expected as far, far as the heterozygous individual goes, uh, slightly more than expected, um, or no, slightly more than expected of the heterozygous individual, or slightly more, sorry, slightly more than expected of the MM individuals um, and less than expected of the heterozygous individuals. Uh, the next would be we could then go and calculate the q squared that's 0 0.485 squared times by times by 97 and that gives us 22.8 again the homozygous we're seeing fewer homozygous uh, or we're seeing more homozygous than we expected and fewer heterozygous individuals than we expected that could indicate that evolution is going on but we have to be sure about that to be sure about that we take it uh, we do a chi-squared test the general formula for a chi-square test, which you um, should have done in 11.10 and maybe 11.20 in genetics and other places, is that we take the difference between the observed and the expected, we square it, and then we divide it by the expected for each of those genotypes. Okay, so um, in this case, we take the first one, the MM genotype, we expected you can do observed minus expected. You just have to get the difference between the expected minus the, the observed. Uh, we get the difference between 27.7 or 25.7 and 29. We square that and divide that by the um, expected amount, which should be 25.7. I hope I, hope that I didn't uh, miscalculate that, but I think it should be okay. Um, we then do that for the heterozygous individual, 42 minus 48.5, square that, divide that by 48.5, the expected. Uh, we then do that for the, the same thing for the NN. We add all of those up and we get a, a test statistic of 1.76. Okay, we need a couple of things for the chi-square test. We need a test statistic, we need degrees of freedom, and then we also... Um, uh, we also need sort of a critical value to tell us if we are within sort of the realms of um, sort of stochastic variation or random sampling error, or if in fact we're we're outside of the those sort of uh, that sort of the if we have deviated enough that we need to say okay our population is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So here we have the sort of the formula for degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom equals the number of genotypic classes minus one minus the number of parameters estimated. The number of genotypic classes 
that we were dealing with was 3, the mm, the mn, and the nn, minus 1, number of the, minus the number of parameters estimated, and this, these, this is the allele frequencies. Since we had just two alleles, once we knew one allele, we ought, the frequency of one allele, we automatically know the frequency of the other allele. So we only had to estimate one of those alleles or one of those parameters. So in this case, it's 3 minus 1 minus 1. So our degrees of freedom is 1. And then we have to pick a, a, a p-value, right? What, at what sort of, this, is, this can be somewhat arbitrary, but at what level are we going to reject it? At what level are we going to say, okay, this is rare enough of an event that we we will not uh, go. We, we won't look to just random sampling error as explaining the deviations from what we expected. And in this class, we're just going to make it easy. We're just going to say we're always going to go with 0 0.05. So in this case, um, the critical value for one degree of freedom at 0 0.05 is 3.81. We had our test statistic of 1. Point, what was it, 1.76, I think. That is less than this critical value. So we would say this population, we don't have good evidence that this population is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. We'll say, okay, this population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. If we, had, we would have calculated it, it would have been, maybe there would have been more deviations. There would have been a larger discrepancy between expected and um, observed, say for instance for the homozygous individuals, right, um, and our test statistic would have been above 3.841, we would have said, okay, we're going to reject that this population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and then we would look at, okay, why isn't it in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium? And this is the important part. Once we find a population, we find that it's not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, we can then look at uh, patterns within that and say, okay, this is what is going on within this population. Maybe there's a certain type of selection going on. In the case where you have uh, an overrepresentation of homozygous individuals and an underrepresentation of heterozygous individuals, that happens when we have a sort of mating going on, where maybe MM individuals tend to want to uh, have offspring with other MM individuals, uh, NN individuals want to have offspring with NN individuals, and MN individuals want to have offspring with MN individuals. That gives us this pattern of an overrepresentation of uh, homozygous individuals and an underrepresentation of heterozygous individu individuals. So we don't, you don't necessarily, you know, we're, we'll talk, we'll, we'll, the next step, what we're going to do is we're going to talk about each of those, but that's the important part. That's kind of the take home message. You use the Hardy-Weinberg model to look at a population and find if these, there are these predictable deviations from the model, from the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And if there is, then we can see that evolution is happening in this population. And then we can tie it to a certain phenomenon that can explain that pattern. And so in essence, this is how we quantify evolution or evolutionary processes by looking, by establishing these, this, this base model, this Hardy-Weinberg model, looking for the deviations and then attributing the deviations to, for instance, one of these four things, for drift, genetic drift, this happens when populations are small, for selection, are certain individuals surviving and reproducing better than other individuals? Is there migration into the population? Is there immigration out of the population? Are new mutations being um, formed within the population? Are certain individuals mating with other types of individuals? Like I mentioned in the last slide, assortative mating. So in essence, this is, this is the importance of the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and it brings evolutionary science into a quantifiable um, study. So now just for an example, let's look at one of those uh, evolutionary processes or mechanisms that causes the deviation in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and see how we would quant we could possibly quantify that in, in like a numerical sense. And so here is that slide from um, a population that's in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and if you start with the initial allele frequencies, take it all the way through, come to the final allele, frequency, allele frequencies, and you see that 
um, big A is still 0 0.6 and little a is still 0 0.4. So this is a this is a population in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Okay, now let's look what would happen if we just, in a real simple sense, add some selection. So again, just as a reminder, natural selection operates in basically two different ways. It provides, or it um, allows for differences in survival between different individuals. Um, so the individual needs to survival. And then it also can operate by acting on differences in fecundity. Fecundity is just basically you know how how much reproductive potential you have how your ability to to have offspring okay so here we return to our original model and we say okay what's going to happen if we have some pretty strong selection against that b2 allele so here um, we start out with the, the initial allele frequency um, we have sort of random mating right we're not looking at that one here we have um, uh, we have uh, our original um, zygotes, right, that form in those same sort of frequencies, so that we don't have any deviation from the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibriums originally. But now we say, okay, if an individual has two B2 alleles, as is indicated there in blue, 50% of them die. That's the selection sort of coefficient. If the individual has one B2 allele, so it's a heterozygous individual, 25% of them die. They don't survive to become juveniles, and then they don't grow up and then leave uh, further offspring. So as we go through, we see that in that next generation, we've now dropped from an allele frequency of 40% to an allele frequency of 3.25% for the B2 allele, and then we've had a increase in the B1 allele. So eventually what's going to happen is generation after generation, you're going to see a reduction of that B2 allele um, until eventually it will, it will be weeded from the population. This figure shows just how quickly an allele, um, the B2 allele can be sort of weeded out of the population or how quickly the B1 allele goes to fixation, meaning it represents 100% of the alleles, right, in the population, um, sort of color-coded there. So, the red is strong selection, the blue is kind of weak selection, okay? And as you can see, depending on the, the, the strength of the selection, a population will move to those frequencies uh, quicker or slower. And we have a way of mathematically quantifying this. And we call this, uh, the, we call these uh, estimates uh, selection coefficients. If you look in the book in box 6.3, um, that just shows you how you would add these selection coefficients to the Hardy-Weinberg model and to the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. Don't worry so much about the details of that, but I do want you to go and just check it out and, and look and, and sort of see that, yes, in fact, we can mathematically treat what is happening um, to these populations. We can, actually, we can also look at selection in natural populations and document the effects um, and see how, how well they correspond to what we would sort of theoretically predict from the mathematical models. There are lots of different experiments that have looked at or applied selective pressures to populations and then see how they responded. The book actually talks about one of the classic uh, selective um, experiments or the experiments on selection done by D Douglas Kavanagh and Michael Clegg, where they were studying Drosophila. Drosophila are fruit flies. Um, fruit flies have or, uh, two different alleles, um, ADH alleles. These are, these are genes or alleles that break down oxygen. There's two different kinds of alleles there. There's a fast allele and a slow allele. The fast corresponds to um, proteins that will move faster across an electrophoresis gel, and the slow corresponds to the allele, the protein that is associated with the allele um, for, the, for the S allele, and it will move not as far down the, the electrophoresis gel. It also corresponds to um, alcohol that breaks down, or I mean, um, proteins that break down the alcohol, the, the ethanol, quicker, the F ones, and then slower, the S alleles. And so what they did is they spiked fruit um, 
with uh, ethanol. So you see ethanol being produced naturally in things like beer, wine, but then also in rotting fruit. Rotting fruit are, you know, a food resource for Drosophila, but ethanol isn't good for them, right? So ethanol is it's something that they want to avoid. And so what they did is they would uh, expose a, a couple of populations to the spiked fruit that also have control populations, and then they would let them grow up uh, a generation and then randomly select some individuals and see what frequency those two different alleles were in the next generation, the next generation, and then again in the next generation. Okay, so here you have the four populations, two control populations that you don't expose the flies to the fruit that have been injected with alcohol, with ethanol, and then two populations that have. And you see the uh, frequency of the fast allele, okay, that, that fast metabolizing uh, alcohol dehydrogenase um, allele. And what you see in the, in the two populations with ethanol, the red and the orange, is that you get a rapid selection for that fast allele. In the control population where there is no alcohol, you just, they basically stay the same, sort of the, pretty much the same frequency. They're around 35, 40 uh, percent. Okay, so this is a good illustration of how we can actually take these evolutionary principles, these evolutionary processes, uh, come up with theoretical models based on Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and then actually go and do experimental evolutionary biology in the lab. We also have lots of examples where we have quantified the, the effects of selection in human evolution and human populations. One kind of interesting um, study has been done on the Foray tribe, it's an indigenous tribe in Papua New Guinea. Um, it's known for its ritualistic cannibalism. Interestingly enough, or, or one of the reasons that it's well known, and maybe some of you have heard of it, heard of it before, is that uh, they have a high incidence of Kuru disease. Kuru is a prion disease. Prions are misfolded proteins that sort of um, recruit other proteins and misfold and cause those proteins to become misfolded. They accumulate over a long incubation time and um, eventually uh, accumulate in the central nervous system and cause spongiform encephalopathy. This is similar to basically uh, another kind of prion disease that you might be uh, familiar with is mad cow disease or chronic wasting disease in um, some of our deer populations. Um, um, another prion disease, probably the most common prion disease, is Creutzfeldt jakob disease, at least in humans, and Kuru is very similar to that. So just that's just a little bit of background on prion disease. Um, it is, it is uh, interesting because when we started to do these studies on prion disease, um, uh, a number of researchers said, okay, uh, people that are dying from, it's, it's, it's a deadly disease, and they want to say, okay, people that are dying from prion disease, uh, do they have any different genotypic makeup than people that survive um, Kuru? So what Simon Mead and others found was that there was a particular uh, gene on chromosome 20 that coded for a protein, and there were two different versions of, these pro of this protein at position 129, one of the versions or one of the alleles had a valine. Um, the other allele at that same position, 129, had a methionine. And what they found is that all victims that died of Kuru had a genotype where at both of, the, both of their chromosome 20s, they had the alleles that had the methionine uh, amino acid at position 129. We can also go and, you know, sort of uh, just to establish this. So then, we have, so, that, so then the first step, I guess, is to say, okay, is that is there selection then because in the 4A tribe they are under a different kind of selective environment because, you know, there's high incidence of this Kuru disease, is selection, selection against the methionine um, allele, the, or we'll just call it the methionine allele because it's the, the uh, 
allele that has that methionine substitute rather than the valine. And so what we need to do is we first, what they needed to do is first they needed to establish what was the level, the genotypic frequencies of those two different alleles in a population that is far removed from Papua New Guinea. And so when they, what they did is they looked at Caucasians and then what they found is that um, individuals that were homozygous for the valine substitution uh, were roughly found at 11%, individuals that were heterozygous were 50%, and individuals that were homozygous for the methionine substitute uh, had a genotypic frequency of 39%. Next, they wanted to see, okay, what is the uh, uh, level, or one is, even though maybe the allele frequencies of both of these two um, different alleles are, are not exactly the same as in the Caucasian sort of population, that's sort of a baseline, they wanted to say, okay, let's look at two populations within the 4A um, tribe in Papua New Guinea, one population for females that were too young to have practiced ritualistic cannibalism. It was outlawed a number of years ago and there were lots of government efforts to get the 4A tribe to stop practicing cannibalism and spreading 4A disease. And so they said, okay, let's take that population, let's look at these genotypic frequencies, right? Let's estimate the allele frequencies and then from those allele frequencies, kind of like we did before, estimate what the Hardy-Weinberg what the Hardy-Weinberg genotypic um, equilibrium equilibria are, and then let's compare that to a population that was exposed to high levels of, of Kuru, or prion disease. And so they, with, the, with the females, they sampled 100, the young females, they sampled 140 of them. They estimated the allele frequency of the methionine allele as 0 0.48, the allele frequency of the valine as 0 0.52, so roughly 50-50 in the population. They then took that through the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and what they found is that the expected genotypic frequencies were, you know, roughly one-fourth, one-half, and one-fourth, the three different genotypes. The observed was, you know, not too far off of that. So what this said is, it said, and this is what you do when you're quantifying uh, natural selection and evolution of populations, is you say, okay, that's, that's what we would sort of expect, so that population is in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And we now have our expected genotypic frequencies if they're in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So next what we have to do is look at the other population, the, other, the population of older females that were exposed to high levels of Kuru disease. So now looking at the, at the genotypes of the females that had practiced ritualistic cannibalism, but that had not uh, contracted um, Kuru. What we see is their allele frequencies are very similar to the other female group, and so the expected genotypic frequencies under Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium were, you know, pretty similar also, but then when we look at the observed genotypic frequencies, what we find is, in fact, there seems to be an overabundance of heterozygous individuals. So what this now tells us is that the heterozygous individuals, the heterozygous, seem to be somewhat resistant to the disease, and so selection actually favored um, the heterozygous individuals. So our goal here isn't necessarily to talk about every single sort of situation and what we would predict in certain situations with different kinds of selection, whether we're talking about dominant or recessive alleles or co-dominant alleles or rare versus common alleles or um, favoring uh, homozygous individuals, heterozygous individuals, et cetera, et cetera. But the point is, is that with our model, we can now make evolutionary biology quantitative and predictable, and we can frame it in... Um, a series of hypotheses. We can frame it within the context of hypothesis testing, uh, accepting hypotheses, and rejecting hypotheses. And so this is, you know, a long ways from where Darwin was sort of proposing these mechanisms and things like that, and a lot of what they were doing wasn't necessarily amenable to stuff that you could do inside of a laboratory or stuff that you could really go out in nature and test necessarily, but that's where we are now at with uh, evolutionary biology. Okay, so let's do this. Let's test to see if we can actually use evolutionary population genetics theory to predict how a certain population
will evolve. And then ideally, and this is what this first study that we're going to look at did, is then ideally you want to then use this population, watch this population evolve and test to see how well your theory fit the actual data. And the first example that we're going to be looking at is uh, selection against a recessive allele or for a dominant allele. Peter Dawson, back in the 1970s, uh, did this experiment on um, a, a population of flower beetles that you see here in the picture. So in the flower beetle system, Lawson discovered that uh, within that population, there was a particular gene that had two different alleles, two different versions of those genes. One was the normal, sort of the wild type um, allele, and if it were, and if it was found in a heterozygous form or in a homozygous form, then the flower beetle was normal, had the normal phenotype. But the other allele was a was a recessive allele, a little l is what he designated it, and if an individual was little l, little l had that genotype, then it was lethal, and that individual would not survive to adulthood. Um, okay, so now we have our system. We have our genet uh, the underlying genetic system uh, to do our experiment. And so now the next step would be then to predict. Okay, if we if we uh, take this system. And let's say we take a population, and we'll see here in a second that the population that he selected was, the original population was made up of all heterozygous individuals. Can we use that population genetic model with the added component of natural selection to it to predict what would happen to that population in the future? And in order to do that, we have to be able to predict it mathematically. And so if you look at box 6.3 in the book, um, they sort of derive these equations, and it's pretty pretty intense mathematically. Um, I'm I just want to sort of show you. I'm I'm not that interested in you getting into the nitty gritty of the mathematics, but just to kind of understand what's going on, and more importantly, to realize that we can use we're using math, we're using the this theoretical foundation to test natural selection and evolution, and so. Um, in box 6.3, they introduce you to um, these, what we will eventually call a selection coefficient, but also the, these um, representations of fitness. And so in this case, we call it W11. And, and in, in, in the book, they're using the genotype A1, A1. Those are two different alleles, A1 alleles. Um, they're using the other allele is A2. And so you have a homozygous A2 homozygous A1 genotype, and then a heterozygous genotype with an A1 and an A2 allele. And they represent the fitness of each of these genotypes, meaning what is the probability that this individual will survive to adulthood. Um, and they represent that with uh, the coefficient W. So W11 is the probability that an individual with a genotype A1, A1 will reach adulthood. And so here you see that we have our normal sort of Hardy-Weinberg um, expectations, p squared, 2pq, pq squared, and then we times each of those by the probability that that individual will survive to adulthood. We then can develop our new equation, if you see there at the bottom right hand, p squared w11 plus 2pq w12 plus q squared w22 w2, equals um, what we call the average fitness. So if you have an average fitness of the population, you can then compare each individual fitness to the average fitness. And if the individual fitness is above the average fitness, then that genotype will go up, right, in the next generation. If the individual fitness is below the average fitness, just in general sense, then then the phenotype, uh, or then that genotype, not phenotype, sorry, that 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 genotype will go down in the next generation. And then we can do that over and over in an iterative sense, uh, generation after generation. So there we have describes for our relative fitness there at the top. Another way of looking at it is looking at the fitness in terms of the S, the selection coefficient, or H, the heterozygous effect. And so in our case, with the flower beetles, S, the selection coefficient, would be equal to 1, 
Um, so if you look there at the A2A2, which is the equivalent of the little l, little l genotype with a selection coefficient equal to one, that means that that individual has zero chance, the A2A2 individual or the little l, little l individual has zero chance of surviving to adulthood. The heterozygous effect um, in this case um, would uh, also, since it since there is no intermediate sort of uh, phenotype with the heterozygous individual, it doesn't have any effect. So uh, the genotype um, A1, A2 would be also equal to 1, also because S is equal to 0, right? Um, and A1, A1 genotype would be equal to 1. And so in that case, that's just a different way um, of approaching this. And we'll see later on uh, that we'll use S, the selection coefficient, mathematically um, to derive a few other things. Okay, so let's get back to our flower beetle population. We're gonna start an initial uh, colony of, of um, beetles, and that initial beetle colony will all be heterozygous individuals. Just for simplicity's sake, let's say we take a 100 beetles. Um, they're all heterozygous, meaning they have one allele that is the wild type, normal allele, one allele that is the lethal, recessive allele. Okay, in this population now, can we describe the allele frequency? Can we, uh, can we calculate the allele frequency of the wild type in the L or the P in the Q? Obviously, if, it's the, the, if each of them are heterozygous, then the frequency of P would be 0.5 and the frequency of Q would be 0.5. But now let's take into account the selection that's gonna, that, that will be happening in that next generation and see if we can calculate what uh, or predict what is going to happen in that next generation. Here we have the predicted, you know, if, if we were to produce another population of 100 individuals um, and we just looked at the, took the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, right, or the, you know, we randomized the population, they're all uh, mating equally, et cetera, et cetera. Then in the next generation, we would expect 25% or 25 individuals in the case of 100, uh, population size of 100 would be wild type, wild type. 50 of them would be heterozygous individuals like the parentals. And then 25 individuals or 25% would be uh, lethal, lethal allele. But if you remember, the lethal, lethal allele is, a le is lethal. And so those 25% would not survive to adulthood. Or you know they we would even say okay they don't even they don't they don't count in the population let's just say they they spontaneously abort right so the new population size would then be seventy five individuals right um, and the new if we were to calculate the new frequencies we would see the frequency of P now has gone up to seventy five percent and the frequency of Q has gone down to twenty five percent so we've gone from a fifty fifty ratio to a 75-25 ratio. That's our first generation. And so what we now would want to what we now want to do is to take that out for a bunch of generations, predict what we think would happen, and then get into the lab and let the beetle populations go through those same number, let's say 12 generations, and see how well our beetle population follows um, our predicted our, our predictions. So here's what those 12 generations look like. There on the top on A, we see uh, the drop in frequency of the recessive allele over the 12 generations. We see a dramatic drop in the beginning and then it's sort of tapering off around generation six to eight. Um, on the bottom, we see the frequency of the dominant wild type allele where it increases dramatically in the beginning and then sort of tapers off towards um, the end. If we look at the uh, uh, symbols, those are our actual data that we observed in the beetle colonations. If we look at the gray lines, that is what mathematically we predicted. And so as you can see here, the predictions and the actual experimental data line up very, very well, remarkably um, well, and you might say, okay, well, that's not too surprising, but really it should be pretty, it should be not surprising, but it should be pretty impressive at least. We've now taken sort of theoretical 
mathematical sort of modeling and tested it in, an, in, a, in a real live population. And whenever we have our predictions lining up that well with what we, what, um, we see in real life, that's pretty impressive. So what we can now do is look at different situations. So with the beetle situation, we saw that the selection coefficient was one, meaning that all of the heteros or all of the homozygous uh, little l little l individuals died. But we could also envision situations where there were where the selection wasn't wasn't as strong as that was you know much less strong um, in this case what we're showing here is a uh, selection against a recessive allele where s is equal to 0 0.5 um, for the dominant allele and what we find is that in fact uh, the same sort of pattern emerges where the recessive allele is selected against and still s an s equal to 0 0.5 is is pretty good pretty strong selection still but what we see is that it takes a lot longer for those populations to taper off. Um, here, you see uh, it isn't until about generation 40 or so where it starts to taper off, whereas before it was uh, around generation eight, six to eight, I think. Um, uh, in this one, it shows the frequency of the little allele going down dramatically, right? But not quite as dramatically. And the frequency of the, of the dominant A allele going uh, increasing, but fairly dramatically, but still not as dramatically as it was before. And so selection isn't acting as quickly when it's not as powerful, right? So that, that kind of makes sense to us. Um, but interestingly, again, here, why does it slow down um, at, at, towards the end? And why doesn't it ever go completely to zero? And the reason for that is when you have it a recessive allele, when it is more rare, it hides out in the heterozygous form. And so here, where everything is tapering off, we can't totally purge our uh, population from that little, from, of that little a allele because at, say, generation 80, um, there are very few heterozygous individuals and a very, basically a 0% chance that a heterozygous individual is going to get together with another heterozygous individual. You know, basically 100% of, of the matings are going to either be between big A, big A, or an occasional big A, big A mating with a big A, little a. And in that case, none of the offspring are going to be little a, little a. Okay, you have to have two heterozygous individuals getting together to have a little a, little a. So it's not going to be exposed to selection. And so those recessive alleles can hide out in the heterozygous form. Um, what I want you to do is I want you to go through just to sort of show you that is take two different allele frequencies. And so in one situation, I want you to uh, calculate the Hardy-Weinberg uh, equilibrium for the genotypic expectations for the big A, big A, big A, little A, and little A, little A, when the big A allele is at 95% and the little A allele is at 5%, and see just what percentage or what portion of the population um, is heterozygous, right? Or what portion of the population is little a, little a, and then also compare that to the reverse or sort of the, the, the other extreme where the frequency of the dominant allele is uh, 5% and the recessive allele is 95%. Uh, that sort of will sort of mathematically illustrate that point. So the last thing that I'm going to say about the selection of dominant recessive alleles is that um, is I, I want you to take note that dominant versus recessive alleles has nothing to do with being favored or not favored. The dominant recessive alleles, in describing alleles as dominant or recessive, all we're doing is describing the interaction between those alleles. One of the alleles dominates over the other. That doesn't mean it's going to be, it is going to be selected for. Students oftentimes think of dominant as being favored, and this is not true. But what is true, and this is what this, this figure illustrates, is that what happens when an, an allele is dominant, it gets exposed to selection much more uh, quickly. Okay, so for instance, in, in A here, uh, 
in the, in the top panel, we see that this is selection against the recessive allele. So it's for the dominant allele. And you see that the frequency of the big A, the, the dominant allele, goes near fixation in very quickly within about 20, 30 generations. It's up at around 80, 90 percent frequency. And so it's very, very fast. If you compare that to B, where you're selecting for the recessive allele, it takes a really, really long time, it takes 60 generations before it even gets up to a frequency in the teens, right? And then once it hits kind of this, this point where you have a lot of individuals, a high uh, probability of individuals that have the recessive alleles because you have to remember an individual has to have both of those recessive alleles for it to have that characteristic for it to be favored and acted upon by selection so there has to be a fair amount of um there has to it has to get to a minimum sort of frequency just like in the last slide where he calculated uh where you where you looked at numerically that it is hard for um, two recessive alleles to get together, if they're rare, they have to get above this point to where they have a, a, a fair probability in getting together. Two heterozygous individuals ha have to have a fair probability in getting together and producing a, um, a, a homozygous, little a, little a, which then can mate with a heterozygous individual. The result would then be um, 50 percent of their offspring would would be little a little a and be favored or mate with another little a little a and then once that once you kind of get over that point then you can see between generation 60 and 80 it goes you know, fairly quickly up towards uh, fixation okay and and in fact you see if you look at the shape of the curves when you're comparing um, um, a the top one and the bottom one you see that the fixation of the frequency of big A kind of generally kind of goes up towards 100%, but, but never quite gets there. That's not true in B because of the dominant recessive interaction, a dominant allele will always be exposed to selection, right? Even in the heterozygous form. And so you see the little A goes to 100% and stays there, kind of sticks there and plateaus um, and that's because the big A allele is being selected against and can't hide out. Next, course, we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about how selection acts differently uh, upon heterozygous individuals and homozygous individuals. Um, we'll start by looking at a, another study that was very similar to the flower beetle study that we looked at. Um, only the, the study organism was uh, fruit flies, Drosophila melanogaster. And what they did, they kind of did the exact same thing. They set up a, a population of fruit flies uh, with all heterozygous individuals for, again, a lethal recessive um, mutation. So everybody's heterozygous. They said, okay, based on our evolutionary population genetics theory, we predict that after about 15 generations, um, the viable allele should reach a frequency of you know, around 94%, the, and then kind of stay there because the um, again this recessive deleterious allele kind of high, will hide out in, in the heterozygous form um, at around that that percentage. And so they made this prediction, okay? But something else ended up happening. What they found was a little bit different. Here, the red triangles represent the uh, data that they gathered over a certain number of generations. Um, uh, there in red, and, and as you can see, the, the frequency of the viable allele sort of tapered off just below 80%. And so it didn't reach that 94, 94%, but actually only reached about 80%. And so then, then they wondered, okay, why is this so? Soon they realized that it was uh, sort of a classic example of the situation that we call overdominance or heterozygous, heterozygous superiority. This is when the heterozygous genotype is the most favored of the three genotypes. So selection acts favorably upon the heterozygous um, genotype. They then 
um, modeled. Uh, they, 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 they then uh, generated a model for the fitness of each of them. And you see that there on the right hand side uh, where they set the uh, survivorship of the heterozygous individual VL as individuals as one and uh, uh, LL again the lethal uh, had zero survivability and then the the viable viable the VV genotype had about a 73 percent chance of arriving to adulthood when compared to the heterozygous individual and so they model it that way they then generated their predictions right uh, the predicted model and that's what you see on with the red line and so you see that the red line uh, fits the data fairly well. But this is different than before. Whereas before, we generated the model, made the predictions, and then we did the experiment, and the experiment sort of uh, confirmed the model. This, in this way, we did it the opposite. We had the data, we then adjusted our model to fit the data. And so it's not, it's not the same sort of thing, right? It's kind of, um, I think the book puts it as it's kind of like, shooting a an arrow or shooting a hole into the side of a barn and then drawing a target around it and so we really haven't proved anything uh with that right but instead but but what it allows us to do is now we have a model that we can then go and test and that's what the blue line represents and so then the blue line says okay here's our system here's our model um, here's our evolutionary model. We're going to predict it. And rather than starting off at a place of 50, 50, uh, with, you know, all the individuals heterozygous, we're going to start out in a position where nearly all of the, um, the little frequency of the, uh, vi uh, the, the little frequency of the viable allele, right? is between 90 and 100 percent and so we have some alleles in there that are lethal in this situation they're obviously so you're going to start out with you know a certain percentage of heterozygous individuals um and then we're going to make some predictions and the prediction would be then that the frequency of the viable allele will drop through generations because of uh the uh, lethal allele, which sounds kind of weird, but the lethal, lethal allele being favored in that heterozygous form. And so they made that prediction. And then you see the, the blue points, the, the blue marks there, then follow along that model prediction fairly well. So here again, we've made an evolutionary model. We've made a prediction. We've then done the experiments and it's confirmed our evolutionary model. So let's look at what happens when selection favors uh, homozygous. And Foster et al. in 72 developed this kind of cool experiment where they manipulated the use of compound chromosomes to create fl uh, fruit fly populations where individuals that had the same compound chromosomes would be selected for to mate with other uh, flies that had the same compound chromosomes. And so what a compound chromosome is, it's when you have a homologous chromosome. So if you look up here in A, those are two homologous chromosomes. Let's say it's chromosome two. One of those chromosomes was inherited from the fly's mother. One of the chromosomes was, her was inherited from the fly's father. And what happens is you have um, these are color coded on the two different arms of a single chromosome, right? And so you have a number of genes that run the whole span of that chromosome. But what happens is you rearrange sort of how the the chromosomes are, are attached to each other. And in B, you see that now one of the chromosomes has two blue arms. And so on the top part of that chromosome, on the bottom part of that chromosome, they're going to have the uh, same the same genes right and same so on the blue one and then on the green one okay and so this is something that happens in nature we during meiosis chromosomes are always sort of exchanging chunks it's a lot more fluid than than we think of uh, but what they're doing is they're actually manipulating it um, you haven't changed the balance of the 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 genetic material you just sort of changed how they were packaged.
The, the problem is, though, is when a, a fly with a compound chromosome goes through meiosis, it doesn't really know how to segregate those homologous chromosomes very well. And what happens is you could get gametes that, and that's what C is showing, that don't have either of those two compound chromosomes, that they have one or the other. And so in the middle there, you see the blue one and the green one. And so a gamete that uh, has, let's look at the one that just has the two blue arms, right? Isn't going to have any of the genes that are present, pr present in the green regions of the original chromosomes. And so that's going to get messed up. Or you can have ones that um, have both, right? And so they're, so they're, so they're zero, have one, have the other, or have both. But you don't have either of them, if you think of what a normal gamete would look like, it would look like having just one cop, one blue arm, and one green arm. And none of those gametes have that. And so the, the, the evolutionary effect of that is that if you look at E down there, when a fly with a compound chromosome mates with a normal fly, um, the egg fuses with the sperm and none of the zygotes uh, are viable. They don't, none of them have the regular complement of genetic material. So what happens is, um, when compound, uh, flies mate with other compound flies, a lot of the gametes have these imbalances, but a quarter of them are viable. And that's what D is showing you. D is showing you the quarter of those gametes that are viable. And so a fly with compound chromosomes, you know, it's not in a great situation. If it mates with a normal fly, none of the offspring are going to be viable. So natural selection is obviously going to select against that. Um, when it mates with other compound, um, other flies with the same compound chromosome, they at least, you know, produce some viable offspring. So what they then did is they set up a population with a mix of flies that had compound chromosomes for either chromosome, compound chromosomes for chromosome three or compound chromosomes for chromosome two. So if a fly mates with a fly that has a compound chromosome two mates with a fly with a compound chromosome three, they're not going to have any viable offspring. Uh, and vice versa. But if a but if a fly with chromosome compound chromosome three mates with another fly with compound chromosome three or or two with two, then a quarter of their um, zygotes are going to be viable. Okay. And so, what kind of matings then do you think are going to be favored in that sort of situation? The obvious answer is that you know. Flies with compound chromosome three are going to be favored to mate with other flies with compound chromosome three. Um, if you set up a population, and let's just say uh, we set up a population at where there was 50 50, um, what will happen if flies are randomly mating, you know, sort of in equal proportions, fl cr flies that are compound, flies that have compound chromosome three are going to mate with flies that have compound chromosome three and two with two. There's no real distinction, but let's say what would happen if we had um, a situation where we had 90% of our individuals had compound chromosome three and only 10% had compound chromosome two. Well, in that situation, what would happen is the vast majority of the flies with random mating that are have compound chromosome two would be mating with flies with compound chromosome three and not have any sort of fitness, right? Whereas a bunch of the of the flies with compound chromosome three are gonna be mating with other flies with compound chromosome three. So it would quickly go to fixation for compound chromosome three. At 50%, it's, it's one way or the other. Once you begin to deviate a little bit from that 50%, if, you, if the frequency of compound chromosome three goes up a little bit, pretty soon selection will take that and then rapidly take it to fixation for that. If it goes below that, selection will take that and then rapidly take chromosome two to um, fixation. And that's what this next slide shows. Here on the left, that, is, that those are the experimental data for exactly the scenario that I just, just described. And so here around 50%, 
the populations either go one way or the other. If it sort of dips down to, um, and this is looking at the frequency of uh, compound chromosome two, if it dips down, you know, below, you know, down towards 40%, it's rapidly then going to go to fixation because most of the flies that have compound chromosome two at 40% are going to probably be mating with flies that compound chromosome three not have any offspring. Whereas a whole bunch of the flies that are have co compound chromosome three will be mating with other flies with compound chromosome three, so they'll be favored and they'll go to fixation. If it goes, if the compound chromosome two gets goes above, like goes towards 60%, then you can see there in the in the experimental data, they are taken and to fixation. Okay, so um, you get these separating populations, right? When homozygous individuals are favored, you get deviation in these populations. Let's just say you set you you set up a whole, you know, in this case they set up eleven different populations, and it looks like you know, half of them went to fixation for compound chromosome 3, and half of them roughly went to fixation for compound chromosome 2, right? Well, you can't get half because there's 11, but you can, you can count them up essentially equal, equal amounts. On the right, that graph shows a situation where they took 13 populations that contained uh, uh, compound chromosome 3 and normal uh, Drosophila. Right. In that case, because the normal flies, when a normal fly mates with a no another normal fly, they're not going to just have 25% of the, the, the zygotes that um, are viable, but they're going to have 100%. And so the, uh, they're going to be favored. And so in this case, you have to bring the frequency of the compound chromosome 2 all the way up to almost 90% for the result to be a fixation for compound chromosome 2 because of this counterbalancing selection for the wild type normal drosophila. And that is, and if you think about it, let's go up to the top of that graph and say, okay, at 90%, you know, if there, it would seem like, you know, uh, there would be strong selection on um, for uh, normal Drosophila, uh, and there is, but even at 90%, the vast majority of those normal flies, there are very going to be there are going to be very very few normal flies that get together with other normal flies to have you know the that for to have offspring of all normal flies and have that sort of 100% viable. Um, zygotes uh, as a result, right? Uh, and so the vast majority of the normal flies are going to be mating with flies that have a compound chromosome 2, and they're not going to get any viable offspring. And so in that case, you can bring the population up to fixation for chromosome 2. Um, and the important thing, the gray lines there are the theoretical predictions. But again, the important thing is that we're able to make these prediction based on evolutionary population genetic models and go and test them with with uh, laboratory uh, populations and confirm these predictions. This just incidentally uh, is what we call underdominance. When the heterozygous individuals are selected for, we call that overdominance. When homozygous individuals are selected for, we call that underdominance. So our um, next and final test of evolutionary population genetics theory is in, we're going to look at a situation where the fitness of a phenotype is dependent on its frequency in a population and see if we can predict those evolutionary outcomes and then test them in a, in a real life natural population. What we call this is frequency dependent selection. And the organism that we're going to be looking at is the elderflower. Here's a picture of the elderflower. As you can see, they come in two different colors, yellow and purple. A pair of researchers, Smithson and McNair, have done a series of studies on the elderflower orchids and how they're pollinated by bees. And what they found is, is fairly interesting. What they 
what, what you see when you go out of nature and, and, and look at elder flower orchid populations is that they typically have both colors, both the purple and the yellow. When you, when um, Smithson, Smithson and McNair looked at the native uh, bumblebee populations and looked at how they were interacting with these um, elder flower orchids, that what they found is that the flowers attract the bumblebees. Um, and so a bumblebee will come into a, a stand of elder flower orchids and will, you know, choose a flower to go uh, and check out to see if it can get some nectar, right? So it goes to one of the flowers, say it goes to a purple flower first, goes in there. The catch is that the bees are always disappointed because the elder flower orchids do not produce nectar. And so what a bee will do is go, it'll go check out a purple flower, uh, get, go inside the purple flower, get all pollinated up, um, like you see there on the picture on the left, but not find any nectar. And so naturally what a bee will then do is look for a different colored flower. And so then the bee will emerge from the purple flower, head over to the yellow flower, do the same thing. Goes into that flower, um, it's disappointed, pops back out, says, okay, I need to look at a different colored flower. It'll then go back to a purple flower and then back to a yellow flower um, and proceed until it eventually gives up. So from an individual fitness perspective, um, the lower the frequency of your color morph in the population, the higher your fitness is going to be. So let's just think about this sort of an extreme example. Let's say you had a population of 97 purple flowers and three yellow flowers. Every time a bee would come into contact with that population, uh, you'd have almost a certain chance if you're yellow to be pollinated or to get your pollen gathered from your from your flower. If you're purple, you would have a very low chance of that. Therefore, natural selection would favor the yellow flowers because they're always getting pollinated. But as that frequency increased of the yellow flowers, then the fitness benefits would be reduced and reduced. So compare the, the 97 purple and three yellow to a 70 purple and 30 yellow and so in the 70 purple and 30 yellow you're probably only if you're yellow you're probably only going to be uh, pollinated every one and every seven or eight times rather than every time a bee encounters you um so what smith and mcnair did is they wanted to, to test this to, to actually say it. so sort of theoretically they thought okay this is you know observing what the bees are doing observing the 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 populations and then seeing that each population had a variation in their color morph they they decided they would set up an experiment to test to, to test this theory to see if in fact um the when the you know color morphs were less frequent in the population they actually uh benefited from higher fitness right and so they set up a bunch of uh, experimental arrays 10 different experimental arrays with 50 different plants um and they varied the the frequency of the yellow morphs at 10 percent 30 percent 50 percent 70 percent and 90 percent and then went back to see if they could uh, figure out if the the fitness varied at these different frequencies. So the way that they measured the fitness um, is that they would go to flowers uh, and look at the and, and judge the relative male reproductive success by looking at how much pollen was removed. Um, they would then look at the female reproductive success and see how much pollen was deposited and uh, if they had a fruit set developing. Um, and so, as you can see, if we look at that top one, this is with the male, you, with uh, looking at the male uh, reproductive success, you, you can see that as the frequency of the yellow flowers increases, goes from left to right, the fitness there on the y-axis decreases through time. I mean, not through time, but through the frequencies. Same thing happens with the two different measures for the female reproductive success. As they become more frequent, their fitness um, 
decreases. And so what the researchers then did is they then mathematically modeled it and came up with uh, that equation there at the bottom. The book goes into a little bit of detail on that equation if you're interested in it, but I'm, I just want to show you that they mathematically modeled it. And then they said, okay, based on these three different measures, and this is what the, the gray line is, they said, at what point would you read it, should you reach an equilibrium? At what frequency should you reach an equilibrium in a natural population? Um, and for each of those, as you can see, you'd looked at the dashed gray lines. So where those two, where the male reproductive fitness success is one, um, uh, or the, 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 the flower's reproductive success from a male perspective is one, and then from a female perspective on both of those things, you go to where those lines intersect. The dash line go. You then go down to the x-axis uh, from that intercept, and that shows you that point. And as you can see, all of three measures indicate that it's somewhere between 60 and 80 percent. Um, the researchers then went out into natural population. So this is a prediction, right? This is then a mathematical prediction based on the data that they gathered that natural population should have the yellow color more should be between 60 and 80 percent. Um, and so uh, they then went out into natural populations and that's exactly what they found. So there are other things affecting the fitness between yellow and purple, right? That's incorporated into this data set. But the point is that they went out there and they found and confirmed the, this evolutionary population genetics theory in natural populations. So it's pretty cool. We've just looked at a number of different situations where we've used population genetics theory to predict the outcomes of evolution, and this is very powerful. Um, but we don't want to sort of oversell it and think that it's going to be this straightforward and this easy to predict the outcome of evolution in all situations. The book has a nice section where it kind of addresses this issue um, in its historic discussion uh, of eugenics and uh, compulsory, compulsory sterilization. So I want you to go and read that part of the book and pay special attention to uh, sort of why, why uh, what, what the, the geneticists at the time, Fisher, um, Punnett, some of the others, a lot of the early geneticists were actually, you know, they were excited about genetics and, and they actually were part of the eugenics movement. Um, and so I want you to pay, pay special attention to what they sort of got wrong in, in this whole discussion. So the last topic that we're going to address in this chapter is mutation. Here, if we go back to our mouse life cycle and we do one turn of the life cycle, we see that uh, we would introduce a mutation there on the left. Um, here... Uh, we've uh, put in a mutation rate of 1 per 10,000, and that's actually a fairly high mutation rate. Um, what we see when we look at this, and we take it all the way through, we see that, yes, in fact, we do have a final allele frequency that is different from our initial allele frequency, um, but that it's not that different. And so what this is telling us is that mutation by itself does not substantially... Um, um, change uh, the allele frequencies or, or the, the evolution. But what we do see is that uh, mutation over a long period of time uh, can eventually produce appreciable change. But for from our perspective, from our evolutionary perspective, mutation, if you remember back in chapter 5, uh, we uh, reiterated many times that mutation is the ultimate source of that genetic variation that evolution needs, but mutation by itself isn't that powerful. When, when mutation is powerful is when it is used in combination with selection for the evolutionary process. So we see that mutation itself can't lead to you know, very dramatic increases in allele frequencies, even over fairly long periods of time. But when we add selection to the mix, we see that mu this mutation and selection combination can, in fact, uh, 
uh, increase the, the allele frequencies and, and provide a crucial piece to the evolutionary process. This is uh, the results of an experiment done by Richard Lenski's lab where they took a single cell, a single bacterial cell, uh, and then grew up um, populations from that and monitored them over time. If you remember, bacteria are do not, uh, you know, for the most part, do not exchange genes. There's no, there's no, uh, all of the genetic variation that's coming into the population. We can then assume is coming from mutation. And so here you see over the three thousand generations, what you have are some sort of steps in increases in cell sizes. Um, sort of dramatic ones. You see the first one there around, I don't know, this generation 300 goes from an average cell size. And then they take periodically take a bunch of cells out and calculate the average cell size. It um, jumps all the way up from 0 0.35 to 0 0.45. And it goes long and it jumps up a little bit more sort of in these incremental steps. What's happening is a new mutation is arising. That new mutation is being selected for and then rapidly be going to fixation in that population. So these two combinate this combination, mutation and selection, can in fact um, be a crucial part of the evolutionary process. Another experiment that shows the um, combination of selection and mutation being crucial to the evolutionary process is an experiment done by Zeng et al. on fruit flies um, that I want you to read about. It's in the book. Uh, we'll just talk, I'll say a few things about it here, but I, I, I do want you to read about it and look at the data and try to interpret the data. Um, what Zeng et al. did is they established uh, essentially a, a, a line of genetically identi identical individuals by doing extreme, by exposing them to sort of extreme inbreeding over 150 generations. Um, at the end of that, they tested how uh, they tested the, the individuals in that in that line, that genetically identical line, to see how tolerant they were to their food, their media being spiked with uh, high salt concentrations. They tested individuals at concentrations of salt between one and six percent. Anything under four uh, percent, the the individuals would would uh, uh, the the larvae. Uh, at least a few of the larvae would survive it at anything under 4%. At 5% or above, they would all die. So what Zeng et al. did then is establish six different, they took individuals from that original line, established six different populations. Um, two of those they then reared on non, in non-salt conditions uh, for, uh, I believe they reared them for 30 generations. At a certain time point, uh, before that 30 generations, they then tested them against the salt, and that's the result you see there on the right. Four of those, so they had two populations that were just in kind of good non-salt conditions, and then four populations they grew in the in this stressed environment where they had salty media, salty media uh, of different concentrations patchily distributed throughout um, their environment, and so uh, the 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 flies um, would then, um, you know, eat the salty media at different concentrations, but there was stress, it was a stressful environment, so there was a pressure for them to do that. There was, it wasn't like there was plenty of food, uh, plenty of non-salty food to eat. And so what they then did after a certain period of time, um, they then tested each of those populations for the how many uh, larvae would survive um, in a 5% salt concentration environment. If you remember the original one, none of them survived after this certain amount of time under these different um, uh, environments, right? And then also uh, freeing them from that extreme inbreeding would allow for mutations to, to rise, selection to take those mutations, and allow uh, selection to to um, to select for individuals that had a higher tolerance for the salt. And so here, this is this combination of selection and mutation. These are, these are the results right here. Um, there's a little bit more detail. I want you to read about that detail um, in the book.
So the book goes a little bit uh, more in detail on on in uh, when talking about mutation and selection and looking at the mutation selection balance and deriving the math for it. Uh, that's that equation there on the bottom. Um, in that equation, you see Q equal to the square root of mu, which is the mutation rate over selection. What I want you to know about that equation is just to look at it in general, and and what it's saying is um, mutation rate. At, uh, most mutations are deleterious, and usually selection acts against them, right? And so the higher your mutation rate, right, the higher the your Q is going to be, and so so you know the more mutation the the, the more mutation that you generate, the higher Q is going to be, but also the higher the selection against them, right? So S, the larger S gets then, the lower the frequency of that mutation. Okay, so there becomes this balance between mutation and selection. And that's all that I want you to know uh, about uh, that equation, just that general, the general stuff. Um, but alleles are always being generated. We need to understand that. They're always being generated. A lot of times um, they're being you know, selected out of the population, especially if they're dominant, remember. A lot of times, though, when they're, when they're recessive, uh, they sort of hide out in the population in the form of, uh, it, it, by being part of a heterozygous uh, organism or individual. So in the end, the Hardy-Weinberg uh, model or population genetics just in general provide sort of a framework for evolution from which we can go in there, we can make predictions about the direction and magnitude of evolution, and then we can go test it. It kind of brings it into that hypothesis testing um, realm. Next chapter, uh, we're going to move on and talk a little bit more about some of these assumptions. Um, another thing that, that this allows us to do is it allows us to go into a population uh, besides just making predictions and things like that, we can go into a population and we can look for deviations in the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, and certain patterns will uh, certain patterns will indicate that certain things are going on. Once we have established this underlying uh, population genetics theory, we can make that it, we can use that to help to let it allow us to say things about the current population, like just how divided. Is, are the subpopulations in this population, just how much gene flow is happening between different populations and things like that.